confession of faith, Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Amen. Let's all greet one another. Let's have a habit of thanksgiving. And with this, the title today is The Grace of Being Used. I already said in detail during the Friday prayer meeting service, but I was unable to be with you last Sunday because I attended the North America College Evangelism Retreat and the Canada Remnant Conference over the past two weeks. And I heard that many people received a lot of grace from Pastor Song Soo Kim's last sermon, and so I asked him to stand on the pulpit again. And so I believe that you received an even greater grace last week. The title of today's sermon is The Grace of Being Used. And on behalf of the Year One Unity, I'm currently traveling around the world and experiencing this grace of being used. So as we live our walk of faith, it is very important for us to live with a sense of grace. And in fact, grace is not something that we have control over. It's not something that we can decide to receive or not. But God has complete control. So grace is given to our lives according to God's will and plan and timetable. So God's grace must come upon us. And the greatest grace of all is the grace of salvation. So everyone is within destruction and yet I have received salvation. Everyone is cursed and will go to hell, but I have received salvation due to God's grace. And Apostle Paul reveals this fact in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 to 9, where it says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. So salvation does not come from us. You didn't receive salvation because you were great or you did something good. But salvation is a gift from God. It does not come from your actions or works of yourself. All the other religions, it's about yourself and your actions. But salvation, it's different. Many different religious denominations, they talk about how faith comes from they talk about how salvation comes from 50% faith and 50% of your own works. But we say that salvation is grace and it is the gift of God. It has been given to us as God's gift. And so when it comes to grace, all you have to do is receive it. Just like how if someone gives a gift to you, you just receive it. If someone gives a gift to you, you don't ask how much was it and you don't ask to pay for it. That might even be considered rude. All you have to do is receive. You just have to accept it and believe. And that's it. Salvation is finished through that. There's nothing else that he requests from us. That's why it is a gift. You just say, Amen, thank you. Within your grace, you say, Amen, and you give thanks. You shouldn't add or take away anything from that. What is even more astounding is that there is a reason why God gave us the grace of salvation. And that reason is so that he can use us. It says that right away. Paul continues to reveal this fact in verse 10. It says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So how amazing is this? God did not do it spontaneously according to his emotions, but he prepared the salvation from a very long time ago. So we are beings that were prepared for good works in Christ Jesus. What is the good works that God talks about? It's not what the worldly religions talk about, but the good work of God, the good work that is written in the Bible is not about ethics and morality, but it's about saving lives. 
When God says good work, it means to save lives. When it says that God uses all things to do good, it means it is focused on saving lives. And to put it theologically, it means living a life that is used in the fulfillment of redemptive history. And this too was given by the amazing grace of God. And so everything that comes out of our mouths should be thanksgiving. Nothing else should come out of your mouths. You should not complain at all because God will be saddened because of that. All you should be saying is thanksgiving and praises. You should be giving thanks for God's grace. And so grace and thanksgiving are like two sides of a coin. They are interconnected. And so those of you who are living a proper walk of faith, you should always be saying words of grace and thanksgiving. However, those who are not living a proper walk of faith, they are running errands for Satan by having continuous unbelief and complaints. And so it's either or. You're living a life that God is joyful for or a life that Satan is joyful for. And so you must look back on yourself and think, did I live a life where God would have would be joyful for? Or did you live a life of running errands for Satan? It's very easy to, def to define this. So I hope that you continuously live a life filled with grace and thanksgiving. Aren't you grateful and thankful that you are even alive? Perhaps it's because I am growing old, but living every single day, I give thanksgiving for that. Because you go to hospitals and you see so many people with illnesses, so many patients on the verge of death sometimes. However, we are here with healthy bodies seated to give worship to God. That's really a blessing that we have received from God. And how thankful should we be for that? That God gave us the works and roles within the church and we are seated here to give worship. You should give thanks for that. So you should not be complaining about anything. So a life of thanksgiving for salvation. And so today is the Thanksgiving Lord's Day. And what day is this? It's a day where we give thanks for how God has guided us for the first half of the year. That he especially gave us guidance and protection and gave us grace and answers. And you say, Th thank you, God, for allowing me to live up until this point. And it's not a temporary Thanksgiving, but you should also go into eternal Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving that someone like me can be used before God. Amen. So being really touched by this and overflowing with Thanksgiving. And so this Thanksgiving Lord's Day is about giving thanks for the previous half of the year, but it's also about asking God to bless us even more and use us even more for the second half of this year because it's the very first week of July. So everything is within God and God's hand, even life and death and everything that happens, whether we are made greater or smaller, everything is within the hands of God. Why? Because God is central to all history. So if you really realize this grace of living as, as God's children, you will be overflowing with thanksgiving every single day. Beginning from today's passage, Mark chapter 11, it shows us how God's plan to, do, to provide us with this amazing grace of salvation and use us in redemptive history is fulfilled. So in today's passage, Jesus finally enters Jerusalem. And Jesus has entered Jerusalem before. However, 
The reason why Jesus enters into Jerusalem in today's passage is not for any other reason, but it is for Jesus to bear the cross. And so it has a very special meaning. So after the sin of the first man, Adam, which occurred in Genesis chapter 3, all mankind left God. And we lived as slaves to Satan and sin and curses and were doomed for eternal destruction. That was our fate. And so in order to save humanity from this problem of Genesis chapter 3, Jesus came to this earth as flesh. Even though Jesus is God himself, he came in order to converse with humans. And so he came in the flesh and entered Jerusalem finally to bear the cross. And bearing the cross was God's solution to solve all problems for mankind. And within history, dying on the cross was the most cr cruel way to die. And yet that is what Jesus had to endure. That is why Jesus entered into Jerusalem. After Jesus began his public ministry, he performed numerous miracles and wonders. And the essential reason for proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom of heaven was to fulfill this mission of the cross. And so he was realistically used precisely according to God's exact time schedule. And in the main passage, another person who was used in this journey of covenant fulfillment appears. It is the owner of the young cult. And this person remains unnamed. And although he seems like an unknown warrior without a name, he decorates a page in the fulfillment of God's redemptive history and provides spiritual lessons for us. So I bless all believers of Yewon Church in the name of the Lord to experience the grace and joy of being used by God and stand as key figures in the fulfillment of the covenant, covenant through today's word. The first main point, immediate obedience. Verse 1 to 3 reads, now, when they drew near to Jerusalem, to Bethphage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever sat. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, Why are you doing this? Say, The Lord has need of it and will send it back here immediately. As Jesus approached Jerusalem, he sent two of his disciples to carry out a mission. So he instructed them to go to the village opposite them, where they would find a colt or a young donkey tied up and one that no one has ever ridden before. And so they were to untie it and bring it to him. And he says that the owner will ask why they are doing that. And he said they were to answer, the Lord needs it. And the pa passage shows that everything happened exactly as Jesus said it would. And when we look at this, we, we must remember that Jesus did not suddenly do this. However, this part is the fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecy about the Messiah. And it's written in Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9. And it was a prophecy that happened 520 years before Jesus came to this earth through the prophet Zechariah. And it says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you, righteous and having salvation is he, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. And so this prophecy has been fulfilled exactly. And Jesus riding on a colt demonstrates that he is the Messiah who comes as the King of Peace, resolving the enmity between God and humanity caused by sin that took place in Genesis chapter 3. And so he came to bring true peace between God and mankind. 
and the large crowd following Jesus expected him to be a political and military messiah who would ride a horse and overthrow the oppressive Romans and liberate Israel. However, the Bible spoke of something entirely different. The Israelites did not properly understand the words of the scriptures, so when Jesus entered Jerusalem, they cheered for him greatly. They welcomed him so much. But soon after, they turned their backs on him and shouted for him to be crucified on the cross. Just before, they had welcomed him saying Hosanna and those voices had suddenly turned to say kill him on the cross and so within our walk of faith what we really need to observe carefully is our own thoughts and standards we should not be focused on our own thoughts and standards but what the word of God is saying those people that do not have the Word of God, they talk about their own thoughts. But those who have the Word of God, they will, be, they will be guided by that Word. Otherwise, people will talk according to their own emotions and standards. And so without covenantal communication, we will inevitably live a life that is shaken by problems, incidents, and various circumstances. And these days, we are being shaken a lot, but I hope you become the ones that remain to the very last moment. Whether it's in the past, whether it's now, we've been constantly shaken so that we fall over, so that we give up, so that we leave. We've been constantly shaken. And in particular, the main passage mentions someone who was used for the fulfillment of the covenant without name or recognition. Who was that? It was the owner of the cult, the owner of the donkey. And the region where this donkey owner lived was Bethany. And Bethany was actually the home of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus who were loved by Jesus. And it was here that Jesus performed the miracle of raising Lazarus from dead after four days had passed. He didn't just save someone who had just died, but he saved someone who was dead for four days. And what we can see from this is that he, Jesus Christ, is the main figure of resurrection and of life. And so what happened to that region after Lazarus was raised from the dead? It created chaos. Everybody knew of this work that Jesus did, that he saved the dead Lazarus. And so he had proclaimed that he was resurrection and he was life. According to John chapter 11, verse 45, many Jews believed in Jesus because of this miracle. And so the owner of the cult also had true faith in Jesus. At the time that this miracle was performed, he had the true faith. And that's why he immediately obeyed when he heard the words, the Lord needs it. He immediately obeyed because he saw back then. And actually, this is very astounding. He did not calculate this or that. He obeyed immediately. And those who have God's covenant and those who have the grace of God, they are able to obey immediately. And what happens when you obey immediately? You are able to be used for the fulfillment of God's covenant. Only when you obey will you be used by God. So experiencing the grace of being used within our walk of faith does not come from anywhere else. We just have to obey immediately when the Lord wishes to use us. Obeying immediately. And so the simplicity of obeying immediately when the word is proclaimed is what leads us to spiritual growth. You might say, I am lacking and my circumstances are a certain way. Or you might think, what will other people think of me? But there is no need to think of these various things. So you might have a very complicated mind when we're living a walk of faith, even though you don't even have an IQ of 200. So I hope you become more simple. Just obey when you receive the word. 
Just believe as it is. Peter was a fisherman and he knew very well of Galilee and that region. And yet he was unable to collect any fish. But a young adult that he had never seen before was walking past, said, go into the deeper waters and throw out your net. So Jesus in his early 30s, this young man that he had never seen before, just told him to go and throw your net in the deeper waters. And it might have been astounding for Peter because he already knew of this region so well. And it was in broad daylight. And there aren't many fish in broad daylight. And especially in deeper waters, it's very hard to get fish. And so it didn't make sense. So during the night, he was unable to catch any fish. And yet, according to the word that Jesus said, he obeyed immediately. And he was able to catch fish to the point that the net was about to rip. It even says the exact number, 153 fish. So believers, obey the word of God immediately. Do not give any excuses. Do you think God does not know that you are lacking? Do you think God does not know of your weaknesses, that you don't have certain things? He knows everything. But regardless of it, the Lord wishes to use you. And I always give testimony about this. I had never done pastoral ministry before, but I was told to go to Seoul and do ministry. And I said, okay. And they said, he said, establish a church. And I said, okay. When the word was given, I just obeyed immediately. You might think, oh, senior pastor Chung is a little bit more special. That's not the case. I was most normal, but I just obeyed God's word immediately. And I was just living in a small town in Busan, and yet God told me to go to Seoul. And I asked God, where should I go? Where do I have to go? And I just came here in a very vague state. And what should I do next? I didn't even know. Regardless of that, the Lord used me. So if we look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 26 to 29, it says that God knows all of our weakness, incompetence, and what we are lacking. However, what is distinctive is that God does not leave us in this state as we are. He does not use us as that state because we are poor, we are ignorant, we are weak. How could God use us in that state? However, when we obey the word of God, God makes us strong, wise, and abundant. That is when he uses us. In that moment that we obey, even though we, spe even though we seem spiritually lacking, all you must do is obey when he entrusts something to you. Then the Almighty God is with you. There's no reason for you to be concerned because the Almighty God will do it in advance of you. Then naturally, you will have to pray. You will bow down before God to request the strength to uphold it. You can say to God, I'm weak, I'm lacking, I'm incompetent, and I cannot do these things. And so you have no choice but to rely on God. And this is the process of raising the partisan of God inside of yourself. Because you are yearning for it, you are able to raise the partisan of God and the partisan of the Word inside of you. What does this mean? It means you will have spiritual growth because you hold on to God and you pray to God so that you will be able to uphold the works and the stewardships that have been given to you. And then you'll be completely changed into the nature of the gospel, the nature of the Word and of prayer. God will change you so that you experience the spiritual growth. And I even give testimony about this. I say that I was so shy to the point that I couldn't even get on a bus. I couldn't do anything. And I had inferiority complex. However, I experienced God completely changing me and healing me. 
So I hope you have the holy burden inside of your hearts. As you live your walk of faith, you have already received salvation. And often you will experience things that is difficult for you to uphold and endure. You have to spend time when you don't even have time. You have to spend money when you don't even have money. But God wishes to have you experience spiritual growth through those time schedule. He does not wish for you to be conceited and use your humanism to do things just because you have a little bit of education, just because you have a little bit of authority. He does not want that. He wants you to rely completely on God alone. When you kneel down before God, you will experience spiritual growth. And that's why the, the roles that you have within the church, the jobs that you have, those are the beginning point of spiritual growth. And Pastor Oswald Chambers, famous for his devotional book titled My Utmost for His Highest, he once said, for understanding in spiritual matters, the golden rule is not intellect, but obedience. So what is the golden rule when it comes for understanding? It is not intellect, but obedience. And it contains a very important message. Spiritual things are not understood with the head, but rather understood through obedience. You can understand everything when you obey. And realization comes when we obey. And this is something I have also experienced my whole life as I relay it to you. You'll be able to understand according to the extent of your obedience, and you will grow and bear fruit according to the extent of your obedience. That's what I experienced as well. God, why are you putting me through these situations? Why are you hurting my pride? You might ask those questions. But in that time, you must ask yourself, did I obey? Did I obey the word of God? Did I obey the word even when I could not understand the word? <laughs> and so I hope you obey when I ask nicely. Do not experience even more hardships because of your stubbornness, but just obey. Then beginning from today, you will receive answers. So I bless all Yewon Church believers in the name of the Lord to immediately obey when it comes to the Word of God and become representatives of obedience that bear fruit and experience change and growth. The second main point, field restoration. Verses 7 to 10 reads, And they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it, and he sat on it, and many spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut from the fields. And those who went before and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. So finally, Jesus rode the colt and entered into Jerusalem. Have you ever ridden a colt, a donkey before? When I went to Israel, I actually had the opportunity to ride a donkey and it was specifically for tourists but a donkey is very small and so I took so much pity on it that I couldn't even ride it properly because it felt like it would crumble under me when I, if I put my weight fully on it and I don't even weigh that much and even when I was sitting on it, my legs could touch the ground. And that was the mother, a mother donkey. And yet in the passage, Jesus had gotten on a young donkey. And so I really believe that Jesus weighed very little. And the paintings and drawings that we see of him were probably not even accurate. Because if he could get on a young donkey, then I believe that he would have weighed around 50 kilograms because of my experience of riding one before. 
And so he got on this young donkey, a colt, and entered into Jerusalem. And if we look at verse 8, the people welcomed Jesus by spreading their cloaks and leafy branches that they had cut and spreading them on the road. And so the crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed behind him shouted, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And this welcome from the people is evidence of their expectations that Jesus was the king who would save them. And even the term Hosanna contains the meaning of save us now. Save us now. And John chapter 12, verse 13 says that the crowd that welcomed Jesus at the time waved branches of palm trees as they cried out, Hosanna. And the branches of palm trees actually represent victory. And there was a reason why the Israelites were waving the branches of palm trees. So around BC 164, which is the intermediary stage between the Old and New Testament, Israel was under the rule of the Greek Empire. And so within the culture of the Greek Empire at the time, they had brought various idols, including statues of Zeus, and so they tarnished the temples of Jerusalem. And at this time, Judas Maccabee, the son of a priest, raised up an army to reclaim Jerusalem and removed all idols. And so they repaired and consecrated the temple. And so at the time when Maccabee entered Jerusalem, the Israelites waved the branches of palm trees to welcome him. Because they were so touched that Maccabee was able to get rid of all the idols. And so they shouted Hosanna as they waved the branches of palm trees. And so Hanukkah is the Feast of Dedication is actually what commemorates this. And so from that moment on, the branches of palm trees were used as a sign that represented the victory of Israel. And right now in the passage, when Jesus is entering Jerusalem, the Israelites were waving the branches of palm trees as they shouted Hosanna. And so at this time, Israel was under the oppression of the Roman Empire. And so and so they were being burdened and pressured and even killed for not bowing before idols. And so beginning from that point, because they refused to bow down, they had to divide the religious denominations into within. And so there was a lot of difficulty within political and religious cultures at the time under the oppression of the Roman Empire. And so they couldn't even give worship freely. Because Rome was such a strong nation at the time. And so they, they had taken away everything from Israel. And so they were within that kind of difficult situation. And so they really earnestly wanted Jesus to become the king that would save them and free them. They only saw Jesus as a political Messiah, and this was actually the shallowest interpretation of him that they could have. So they wanted Jesus simply for needs pertaining to reality. And they wanted to crown Jesus as their king because they believed that whoever showed the miracle of the five loaves and two fish and who brought Lazarus back to life, they thought that this Jesus could fulfill all their materialistic needs and they would be able to prosper on this land. 
they would be that he would be able to fulfill all their needs. They were unable to see Jesus as the one who would fulfill the fundamental problems and free us from the curses of Genesis chapter 3. That's what we are like within the church as well. We think if I go to church and believe in God, my business will prosper and I will receive these kind of answers. Those answers can come. However, that must not be the purpose of why you go to church. Why must you go to church? To give glory to God. You must come to church for God instead of using God and using the church for your own needs. That's wrong. That's a wrong faith. So the people of Israel shouted out for Hosanna, but their chant was void and blind to the extent that the chant became the outcry to crucify Jesus in only five days. In only five days. So we must not shout such vague Hosanna as the people of Israel did, but we must proclaim the genuine spiritual Hosanna. We must restore the field. There are plenty of people in our fields who are under the same delusion like the people of Israel. They are living with the introductory things in the fields. They are lost and wandering, unaware of the spiritual truth. They are constantly within conflict and wandering. If you do not realize the uniqueness of the gospel, then you just live a religious life. In other words, you are burdened and oppressed. You are completely oppressed. But I hope you believe you have received liberation. You have been freed. And I will talk about this in the Newcomers VIP day. But you are completely liberated. Within God, we are completely liberated. And there is a popular saying that goes, the greatest enemy of communication is not miscommunication, but the illusion that it has taken place. A problem will never be solved when one is under an illusion. And situations will become more serious as one repeatedly goes down the wrong path. And from a spiritual perspective, the illusion that we know something or thinking what I think is the truth. And that's what a lot of non-believers do. They think my judgment is correct. And this is actually the greatest miscommunication. We must proclaim the correct way to communicate with God. The only way to have eternal life is through Jesus Christ alone. So I bless all Yewon believers in the name of the Lord to stand as absolute disciples of Jesus Christ. This is the conclusion. The low birth rate issue in our country is so severe right now that the government has declared it a national emergency. And in the past, this was not the case. In the past, it was common to have more children, even more than 10 children in a family. And so in, in the past, there were even slogans encouraging birth control. In the 1960s, there was a slogan saying, if you keep having children indiscriminately, you will end up in poverty. And in the 1970s, the slogan was, don't distinguish between sons and daughters, just have two and raise them well. And even then, there were too many children. And so in the 1980s, the slogan went as far as to say, two is too many, just have one and raise them well. And so they encouraged people to have just one child. But now the situation has completely changed. 
People are not having children, and so the government and local authorities are coming up with various support measures, promising to take responsibility for childbirth and child care, encouraging people to have more children. And a company named Puyong even has a childbirth support policy that gives 100 million won to employees who have a child, and yet people are still not having children. And so the low birth rate problem is very s serious. And even Korean churches are experiencing severe spiritual low birth rate. And it is not an exaggeration to say that the trend is equivalent to the national birth rate. And so the Yewon unity must become the main figures who changes the stream of the field. So Yewon young adults, really, you must put an effort to have children. And you, can, you must increase birth rates to evangelize more. So either increase the birth rate of our nation or evangelize more. Do at least one of the two. Because giving birth can also lead to evangelism. Imagine having four or five children, four or five remnants as disciples that evangelize. And if you don't want to give birth, then evangelize more. So rewards are all given from above. And they're all prepared from above. And so the crown of glory that is beyond our imaginations has already been prepared. So I hope our Yewon believers are used greatly by the Lord. So I bless all Yewon believers in the name of the Lord to be used greatly in the works of saving lives and become the field evangelism disciples who build absolute partisans of Christ wherever you go. Let us pray. Living Father God, for this Thanksgiving Lord's Day, we give thanks that you have led all Yewon believers up until this point for the first half of the year. We believe you will lead us even more greatly for the second half of the year. And we give thanks that you have guided us and given us grace according to our stewardship. Let us continuously become people of your word within our walk of faith. I pray in Jesus Christ's name. Amen.